when you think of homeless, you don't necessarily think a child or like a youth. You think of like an adult or something. I was homeless from summer of 2012 till spring of 2013. And that was excruciating. I don't want to worry about where I'm going to lay next. I didn't tell any like relatives because the ones that knew didn't want to help out and I don't necessarily beg because if you don't want to help me the first time you say no, I'm not going to waste my feelings. My friends went to their houses, they had family to come pick them up. It was just me on the bus or trying to knock on my family's door and see if they would open it to let me spend the night or sleep on the floor or on the couch and everything is what hurt the most because it's like you have the space it's just you just don't want to help and i just sat on the bus stop and just cried myself to sleep the way i was introduced to vfz was kind of negatively but it turned out positively i was in class and I kind of got into an altercation with the younger girl. And I was sent to the office and they sent me to Violence Free Zone. And they basically sat us down and they, <clears throat> they basically told me that, of course, my actions weren't right. They gonna ask you your situation, what's up, what's wrong, and then they'll help you resolve it. And ever since then, I've just been tied to Violence Free Zone. Especially Lulu. She's my favorite. Lulu, I call her my teddy bear. She is like the funniest, sweetest BFZ person I met. She knew that I was battling something emotionally, but that was at a time where I didn't really want to tell anybody yet. So it was around prom and we were all getting ready. And then we were at this Running Rebels event for like prom. They were giving away dresses and makeovers. And I was like, Lulu, can you just help me out so I can get my makeup done for prom? I'm like, I really don't have it. I don't even have a place to stay tonight. So I was just like, I've been homeless since last year summer. So that's when she took me to the side and she made me tell her, which of course I was open and willing to tell her because I've been with her for so long. She tried to stop from crying. We're like her kids, so of course she wants us to tell her anything that's going wrong in our lives so she can you know, or help us find a good outcome to it. So she was just like, okay, I'm getting your cell phone number now and we're gonna talk. It was great knowing that I can contact her outside of school because it's like if I need you, if I just need somebody to talk to somebody, I can just rely on that to judge me. Violence Free Zone is like, completely cool to our school because we all love them. They like liven up your spirit. It's always laughter in there. Like there's not one time where you could just walk in there and be mad the whole time. Somebody gonna make you laugh in there. You got to go to Indianapolis, Atlanta, Florida, all on like college tours for the seniors and the juniors. I left a folder on like, we have this giant desk in the middle of the room. So Lulu goofy butt being nosy in a good way. She opened it and she read it. And she was like, Cache, you didn't tell me that you got an award. You didn't tell me you got accepted to college. And I necessarily wasn't happy about it because I didn't really think that I had the drive or the motivation to go to an out-of-state college. I really didn't feel like it was nothing because of the situation that I was in. I didn't have a place to stay. I didn't have anybody to basically rely on. So... I told her she was all happy and she made me happy. She finally gave me like the realization that it's something important. So she put them up on the wall, the college acceptance wall. So in total, I was accepted to five colleges this year. And my top two choices, well, that I had to debate about was Tuskegee University and the Xavier University of Louisiana. They signed me up the next week for Lissy's Place. They provide you with a house if you like coming out of a shelter, like a little apartment room. And I now stay there happily. So, this is my room that I got thanks to Violence Free Zone. 
and the first time I got here, I literally opened the door and jumped on the bed like a big kid. It's just good to have a stable place where you can just sleep. I'm Cache. I'm 19 years old and I am a 2013 graduate of Pulaski High School. I feel humbled and thankful for all the help that Violence Free Zone has given to me. Without Violence Free Zone, I still be on the street. And I wouldn't have graduated. I wouldn't have did half the stuff that I have done, like prom and everything. I just would have quit. Violence Free Zone has helped me cope a lot and helped me even get out of the situation. So. I'm just grateful that they're there and I know they didn't have to be there for me but I'm really glad that they were. Cache is just one story of hundreds of young people that have been helped by youth advisors to escape the ravishes of living in a toxic neighborhood faced with many challenges. It's her resilience, her character, that really propelled her to resist the temptations befalling other kids in that environment. But it was also the youth advisors that gave her a hand up and a way out. I'm often asked, uh, well, what about mentoring? Well, there's mentoring and then there's mentoring. There's mentoring by people outside who come in and perhaps uh, meet with a child once a week or twice a week, but there's really not a personal relationship. Indigenous mentors, like the youth advisors, make a long-term commitment to the kids. They're not going to be in their lives for the life or length of a program. Their relationship doesn't end when the grant ends. Oh, I love you too. I'm going to miss you. There are studies that demonstrate that short-term mentoring in many cases can be destructive to a child. Many of our kids grow up with disappointment. And so when someone shows up to mentor and it's for a limited amount of time, with all kinds of external restrictions on that relationship, it can be devastating to a child. These children have undergone and experienced a lot of disappointment. The mentoring relationship should not be one of them. Vulnerable kids in these crime-infested, drug-infested neighborhoods need more permanence in their life. The word permanence should be associated with mentoring. Many of these kids don't have stable families. The youth advisors are often substitutes for families. Traditionally, what we rely upon are police, cameras, shot detectors, security. Well, we know that that's not going to do it. Or they'll come into a school and fire all the teachers. But unless there is civil order, you can't determine whether teachers are competent or not. Because it's impossible for teachers to teach in a school where there's civil unrest and disorder. So the youth advisors are not a replacement for school security or for student, for school counselors. They are a supplement to the existing school resources. And as a result, it makes everyone's jobs better. Yes, she actually is. They put it all on us teachers before. 
it's hard to counsel like two, three hundred kids. I like the fact that they come in and they come in and they talk to the kids. They come in all the time, talk to the kids, and then they're interested in what they say, which is a good thing. You know, not many teachers want to listen. You know, we're just here to teach. I'm here to teach you, desensitize myself, and I'm going to go home and leave you with your problems. I'm not like that, and they're not like that. Our youth advisors are uniquely qualified to earn the trust and confidence of some of the most troubled youth in the country. If you have a, a student body of a thousand students, they are influenced by 10%. Our youth advisors, the first task is identify that very troubled 10%. And then what they do is convert these troublemakers into ambassadors of peace. So the same leadership that they exercise for negative purposes can be rechanneled so they are the leaders in making the schools safer. What is the, the antidote for snake bite? You take some of the venom from the snake and apply it in a social context, taking people who were troublemakers and convert them into peacekeepers. Because once their character changes, their characteristic has an advantage over everyone else. Because children look at these former troublemakers and these former troublemakers are witnesses to the children that you can change that it's okay to change that when you change it doesn't mean you have to be uh, less respected so it's really changing the culture of despair and pathology in this community, using as agents of their change, people who were the purveyors of the problem. They share the same cultural zip code and they live in the same geographic zip code. You see the child at the store, at church, at the movie theater, at the restaurant. Is somebody who exudes love and respect for them, someone who doesn't look at it as a job, but as a calling. They see beyond the destruction. They see beyond the despair. They see the sleeping hero in the lives of these children. And they invest their time, they invest their money, and they make a lifetime commitment to serving these young people. They have overcome some of the same challenges that they are summoning the children to overcome that just because you're in poverty, you don't have to be of it. Just because you're in a drug-infected household, you don't necessarily have to be of it. In order to be effective in transforming young people, you gotta be available to them 24-7. So the first thing our youth advisors do is give the kids their cell phone numbers. They need you to be available. Not when it's convenient for you, but when it's necessary for them. If it's Friday night and it's four o'clock and they're going home, can they call you and say, four members of the Gangster Disciples are waiting for me outside my public housing project. Can you help me? Or I've gotten home at seven at night and my family has been evicted and all of our furniture is out on the street. Can you help me? Our youth advisors encounter these challenges every day. And it's because they're able to respond immediately and because they're available, it means they're effective. The Center for Enabled Enterprise really needs financial support from the public that will enable us to produce thousands of caches in America. The transformation is possible in the most troubled, crime-infested, drug-infested neighborhoods that these nonprofit organizations that have been serving the caches of this world in Milwaukee and around the country, that they are a very rich resource that if properly supported can expand to make the entire city and the entire nation a much safer place.